Welcome back to Van's reading. This is chapter two of the international bestseller Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahn Kahneman. Is it Kahneman? Kahneman? Can't even say his name still, but whatever. <clears throat> chapter two, attention and effort. In the unlikely event of this book being made into a film, system two would be a supporting character who believes herself to be the hero. The defining feature of System 2 in this story is that its operations are effortful and one of its main char characteristics is laziness, a reluctance to invest more effort than is strictly necessary. As a consequence, the thoughts and actions that System 2 believes it has chosen are often guided by the figure at the center of the story, System 1. However, there are the vital tasks that only System 2 can perform because they require effort and acts of self-control in which the intuitions and impulses of System 1 are overcome. Mental effort. If you wish to experience your system to working at full tilt, the following exercise will do. It should bring you to the limits of your cognitive abilities within five seconds. To start, make up several strings of four digits, all different. Four, five, three, two, all right? And write each string on an index card. Place a blank card on top of the deck. The task that you will perform is called add one here as here is how it goes. Start beating a steady rhythm, or better yet, set a metronome at one second. Remove the blank card and read the four digits out loud. Wait for the two beats. Then report a string in which each of the original digits is incremented by one. If the digits on the card are 529 for the correct answer is correct response is 6305. Okay, so Start beating a steady rhythm. Or better yet, set a metronome. Remove the blank card and read the four digits aloud. Wait for two beats, then report a string. In, what who has time for this? Like what the, I'm reading a book here, not Jesus Christ. Sorry for my for the Christians out there. Keeping the rhythm is important. Okay, few people can cope with more than four digits. And the add one task, but you want to want a harder challenge. Please try add three. Oh my god, who the fuck has time for this? If you would like to know that what your body is doing while your mind is at hard at work, set up two piles of books on a steady state on a steady table. Place the video camera on one and lean your chin on the other. Okay, wait, wait. Place a video camera on one and lean your chin on the other. Get the video going and stare at the camera lens while you work on add one or three or add three exercise later you find the changing size of your pupils a faithful record of how hard you worked so i have to add numbers well, let's, see. let's see if this works baby let's, i would was it i don't even remember the numbers i don't know what do you add the number by one oh it's a big deal Actually, this is useless. I'm not going to do that. That's boring. I don't have time for that. This is one fucking stupid book. Okay, wait, listen, let's just... He's, uh, the problem with book exercises, they never work. Like, who wants to do them? Like, who is... I'm going to fucking do all that? Really? Really? Just to put a YouTube video on and then let me see what goes on. I don't fucking... Be decency to ask me to do that. Later, you'll find the changing size of your pupils, a faithful record of how hard you work. I have a long personal history with the Add One task early in my career. I spent a year at the University of Michigan as a visitor in a laboratory that studied hypnosis, casting about for a useful topic of research. I found an article in Scientific American in which the psychologist Eckhart Hess described the pupil of the eye as a window to the soul. I reread it recently. I reread it recently and again found it inspiring. It begins with Hess reporting that his wife had noticed his pupils widening as he watched beautiful nature pictures. And it ends with two striking pictures of the same good looking woman who somehow appear much more attractive in one than the other. There is only one difference. The pupils of the eyes appear dilated in the attractive picture and constricted in the other. Hess also wrote of Belladonna, a pupil dilating substance that was used as a cosmetic and of a bizarre shoppers who wear dark glasses in order to hide their level of interest from merchants. One of Hess's findings especially captured my attention. 
He had noticed that the pupils are sensitive indicators of mental effort. They dilate. Ugh. One of his findings especially captured my attention. He had noticed that the pupils are sensitive indicators of mental effort. They dilate sub substantially when people multiply two digits. Uh, two, uh, let me play. They dilate substantially. Uh, they dilate substantially when people multiply two digit numbers and they dilate more of the problems are hard than if they are easy. His observations indicated that the response to mental effort is distinct from emotional arousal. Hmm. Okay. Hess's well, work did not have much to do with hypnosis, but I concluded that the idea of visible indication of mental effort had promise as, as a research topic. A graduate student in the lab, Jack, Jackson Betty, shared my enthusiasm and we got to work. Betty and I developed a setup similar to an optician's examination room in which the experimental participants leaned her head on a chin and forehead rest and stared at a camera while listening to pre-recorded information answering questions on the recorded beats of a metronome. The beats triggered an infrared flash every second, causing a picture to be taken. At the end of each experimental session, we would rush to have the film develop projects. The, uh, I guess, sorry, let me go back. Project the images of the pupil on a screen and go to the work and go to work with the with a ruler. The method was a perfect fit for young and impatient researchers. We knew our results almost immediately and they always told a clear story. Betty and I focused on a pace task such as at one, which we knew precisely what was on the subject's mind at any at any time. We recorded strings of digits on beats of the metronome and instructed the subject to repeat or transfer the digits one by one. Maintaining the same rhythm. We soon, okay, so you would now I get it. So every time you would do, 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 you would like increase the number by an increment, and then they would make it more difficult by adding three. So you go, do, and then you add three to the four digits that you made up in your goddamn head, but whatever. Uh, we recorded strings of digits on beats of the metronome and instructed the subject to repeat or transform the digits one by one. Maintaining the same rhythm, we soon discovered that the size of the pupil varied second by second, reflecting the changing demands of the task. The shape of the response was an introverted V. As experienced, if you tried add one or add three, effort builds up with every added digit that you hear, reaches an almost intolerable peak as you rush to produce a transport string during and immediately after the pause and relaxes gradually as you unload your short-term memory. The pupil dotted corresponded precisely to subjective experience. Longer strings reliably caused larger dilations. The transformation task compounded the effort and the peak of pupil size coincided with maximum effort. So the more effort, the more your pupil size will increase, but the longer the string, the more of a stress relief you would feel, I guess. At one with four digits caused a larger dilation than the task of holding seven digits for immediate recall. At three, which is much more difficult, is the most demanding that I've ever observed. In the first five seconds, the pupil dilates by about 50% 50, uh, 50 of its original area and heart rate increases by, by about seven beats per minute. This is as hard as people can work. They give up if more is asked of them. When we expose our subjects to more digits, then they could remember their pupils stopped dilating or actually shrank. We worked for some months in a spacious basement suite in which we had set up a closed circuit system that projected an image of the subject's pupil on screen in the corridor. We also could hear what was happening in the laboratory. The di diameter of the projected pupil was about a foot watching it dilate and contract when the participants was at work was a fascinating sight, quite an attraction for visitors in our lab. We amused ourselves and impressed our guests by our ability to do, to divine when the participant gave up on a task. During a mental multiplication, the pupil normally dilated to a larger size within a few seconds and stayed large as long as the individual kept working on the problem. It contracted immediately when she found a solution or gave up. As we watched it from the corridor, we would sometimes surprise, surprise both the owner of the pupil and the guest by asking, why did you stop working just now? The answer from the inside lab was often, how did you know? To which we, we would reply, we have a window to your soul. <laughs> the casual observations we made from the corridor were sometimes as informative as the formal experiments. I made a significant discovery as I was idly watching a woman's pupil during a break between two tasks. She had kept her position on the chin rest so I could see the image of her eye while she engaged 
in routine conversation with the experimenter. I was surprised to see that the pupil, pu that the pupil remained small and did not noticeably dilate as she talked and listened. Unlike the tasks that were, we, we were studying, the mundane conversation apparently demanded little or no effort, no more than retaining two or three digits. There was a eureka moment. I realized that the tasks we had chosen for study were exceptionally effortful. An image came to mind, mental life. Today, I would speak of the life of system two. It is normally conducted at the pace of a comfortable walk, sometimes interrupted by episodes of jogging and on rare occasions by a frantic sprint. The ad one and ad three exercise of sprints and casual chatting is, is a stroll. We found that people when engaged in a mental sprint may become effectively blind. What the fuck? When engaged in a mental sprint may become effectively blind. The authors of the invisible gorilla had made the gorilla invisible by keeping the observers intensely busy counting passes. We reported a rather less dramatic example of blindness during ad one. Our subjects were exposed to a series of rapidly flashing letters while they worked. They were told to give task complete uh, they were told to give the task complete priority, but they were also asked to report and at the end of the digit uh, uh, at the end of the digit task where the letter K had appeared at any time during the trial. The main finding was the ability to detect and report the target letter changed in the course of ten seconds of the exercise. The observers almost never missed a K that was shown at the beginning of the near or the near sorry, let me repeat that. The observers almost never missed a K that was shown at the beginning or near the end of the add one task, but they missed the target almost half the time when mental effort was at its peak. Although we had pictures of the wide open eye staring straight at it, failures of detection followed, followed the same inverted V pattern as the dilating pupil. The similarity was re reassuring, re reassuring. The pupil was a good measure of the physical arousal that a company's mental effort, and we could go ahead and use it to understand how the mind how the mind works. Much like the electricity meter outside your house or apartment, the pupils offers uh, the pupils offer an index of the current rate at which mental energy is used. The analogy goes deep. You, your use of electricity depends on what you choose to do, whether to light a room or toast a piece of bread. When you turn on a bulb or a toaster, it draws the energy it needed it needs, but no more. Simply, we decide what to do, but we have limited control over the effort of doing it. Suppose you're shown four digits, say 9462, and told that your life depends on holding them in memory for 10 seconds. 9462, however, 9462, 9462, however much you want to live, you cannot exert as much effort in this task as you would be forced to invest to complete an ad three transformation on the same digits. Oh shit, yeah. 12. Seven, nine, five. Okay, got it. It took a, it did take a little bit of effort. System two and the electrical circuits in your home both have limited capacity, but they respond differently to a threat and overload. A breaker trips when the demand for current is excessive, causing all devices on that circuit to lose power at once. In contrast, the response to mental overload is selective and precise. System two protects the most important. <laughs> System to protect the most important activity so it receives the attention it needs. Spare capacity is allocated second by second to other tasks. In our version of the gorilla experiment, we instructed the sorry, we instructed the participants to assign priority to the digital task. We know that they followed the we know they followed that instruction because the timing of the visual target had no effect on the main task. If the critical letter was presented at a time of high demand, the subject simply did not see it. When the transformation task was less demanding, detention, detection performance was better. So the sophisticated allocation of attention <clears throat> has been honed by a long evolutionary history. Orientating and responding quickly to the gravest threat or most promising opportunities improved the chance of survival. Let me read that again. Orienting and responding quickly responding quickly to the greatest threats or most promising opportunities improve the chance of survival. Whoa, that's cool. And this capability is certainly not restricted to humans. Even modern human system one takes over in emergencies and assigns total priority of self-protective actions. Imagine yourself at the wheel of a car that unexpectedly skids on a large oil slick. You'll find that you've responded to the threat before you became fully conscious of it. Mm. 
Betty and I worked together for only a year, but our collaboration had a large effect on our subsequent careers. He eventually became uh, he eventually became the leading authority on cognitive pupillometry, and I wrote to I now wrote a book titled Attention and Effort, which is based in a large part of what we learned together on the follow up research I did at Harvard the following year. We learned a great deal about the working mind, which I now think of as system two from measuring pupils in a wide variety of tasks. As you become skilled in tasks, it demands, it, it's demand for energy dimish, diminishes. As you become skilled in a task, it demand, it's demand for energy diminishes. Studies of the brain have shown that, that the pattern of activity associated with action changes as skills increases with fewer brain regions involved. Talent has similar effects, highly Intelligent individuals need less effort to solve the same problems. As indicated by both pupil size and brain activity, a general law of least effort applies to cognitive as well as a physical exertion. The law asserts that if there are several ways of achieving the same goal, people will eventually gravitate <clears throat> to the least demanding course of action. In the, in, the uh, in the economy of action, effort is a cost and the acquisition of a skill is driven by the balance of benefits and cost. Laziness is built up, is built deep into our nature. Ooh, that's a, that's a burn. I guess we are pretty lazy, but that, I think it's a good thing because that's our bio biology. The tasks that we studied varied considerably in their effects on the pupil. At baseline, our subjects were awake, aware. <laughs> the tasks that we studied varied considerably in the effects on the pupil. Effects on the pupil. The tasks that we studied varied considerably in the effects on the pupil. At baseline, our subjects were awake, aware, and ready to engage in task, probably at a higher level of arousal and cognitive readiness than usual. Holding one or two digits in a memory or learning to associate a word with a digit three equals door produced reliable effects on a momentary arousal above the baseline, but the effects were minuscule. Only 5% of the increase in the people diameter associated with add three. A task that required discriminating between the pitch of two tones yield significantly larger dilations means more work. Recent research has shown that inhibiting the tendency to read distracting words as a figure as in figure two of the preceding chapter also induces moderate effort. Tests of short-term memory for six or seven digits were more effortful as you can experience the request to retrieve and say aloud your phone number or your spouse's birthday. Also requires a brief but significant effort because the entire string must be held in a memory as a response is organized. Mental multiplication of two digit numbers and the add three task got near the limit of what most people can do. What makes some cognitive operations more demanding and effortful than others, what outcome must be purchased in the currency of attention? What can system two do? do that? System two do that system one cannot. We now have a tentative answer to this to these questions. Effort is required to maintain a simultaneously in memory cell. Sorry, let me repeat that. I screwed that sentence up. Effort is required to maintain simultaneously in memory several ideas that require separate actions or that need to be combined according to a rule. Now that is actually, let me go to, I'm going to read that again. Effort is required to maintain simultaneously in memory several ideas that require separate actions or that need to be combined according to a rule. Rehearsing your shopping list as you enter the supermarket, choosing between the fish and the veal at the restaurant or combining with uh, a surprising result from a survey with the information that the sample was small, for example. System 2 is the only one that can follow rules, compare objects on several attributes and make deliberate choices between options. The automatic System 1 does not have these capabilities. System 1 detects simple relations. They are, like, they are all alike. The son is much taller than the father and excels at integrating information about one thing, but it does not deal with multiple distinct topics at once, nor is it adept at using purely statistical information. System one will detect that a person described as a meek and tidy soul with a need for order and structure and a passion for detail resembles a character librarian. But combining these intuition with knowledge about the small number of librarians is a task that only system two can perform. If system two knows how to do so, which is truly 
uh, which is a which is true of few people a crucial capability of system two is the adoption of task sets it can program memory to obey an instruction that overrides habitual responses yeah that's cool always love that that's right guys remember uh -huh. consider the following count all occurrences of the letter f in this page Ooh, here we go this is not a task you have ever performed before and will not come naturally to you but for system two can take it on it will be effortful to set yourself so that's hold on that's one two for this there's three exercise plus five okay carry it out though you will surely improve with practice Psychologists speak of executive control to describe the adoption and termination of task sets. And neuroscientists have identified that's I think that's six or seven, I can't remember. Let me cut that. Yes. Wait, so, so I'm gonna go two, three, five. Six. So let's go. Neuroscientists have identified the main regions of the brain that serve the executive function. Seven. One of these regions is involved whenever a conflict must be resolved. Conflict, that's eight. And other is the prefrontal area of the brain, a region that is substantially, that's nine, substantially more developed in humans than in other primates and is involved in operations that be associated with intelligence now suppose at the end of the page you get another instruction count all the commas in the next page this will be harder because you will have to overcome the newly acquired tendency to focus attention to letter f one of the significant discoveries of cognitive psychologists in recent decades is the switching from one task to another is effortful especially under time pressure the need for rapid switching is one of the reasons that add three and mental multiplication are so difficult uh, to perform the add three task you must hold several digits in your working memory at the same time associating each with a particular operation some digits are in the queue to be transformed one is the process of the pro transformation and the other already transformed are retained for reporting Modern tests of the working memory require the individual to switch repeatedly between two demanding tasks, retaining the results of one operation while performing the other. People who do well on these tests tend to do well on tests of general intelligence. So, okay, that's interesting. So, like the switch between the two systems is what make people good at tests. Because, interesting. I mean, I've seen people who are like really smart and like for me, I hate tests like oh my fucking god like they fucking suck even like sometimes you know i do really well sometimes i don't but the people who generally do well are really good at doing that like switch <clears throat> because they they notice it and then they have to use that so it's kind of it's actually like a muscle in a way so sorry i just lost my uh one operation while performing the other. People do so. Modern tests of working memory require the individual to switch repeatedly between two demanding tasks, retaining the results of one operation while performing the other. People who do well on these tests tend to do well on tests of general intelligence. However, the ability to control attention is not simply a measure of intelligence. Measure of efficiency in the control of attention predicts performance of air traffic controllers and of Israeli Air Force pilots beyond the effects of intelligence. Time pressure is another driver of effort. As you carried out the add three exercise, the rush was imposed in part by the metronome and in part of the load on the memory. Like a juggler with several balls in the air, you cannot afford to slow down. The rate at which material decays in memory forces the pace, driving you to refresh and rehearse information before it is lost. Any task that requires you to keep several ideas in mind at the same time has the same hurried character, unless you have the good fortune of a capacious working memory. You may be forced to work uncomfortably hard. The most eff effortful forms of slow thinking are those that require you to think fast. The most effortful forms of slow thinking are those that require you... What? Unless you have a good fortune of capacious working memory, you may be forced to work uncomfortably hard. The most effortful forms of slow thinking are those that require you to, require you to think fast. <coughs> uh-huh, okay.
Okay. You surely observed as you performed ad three how unusual. Uh, hold on. You surely observed as you performed ad three how unusual it is for your mind to work so hard, even if you think for a living. Few of the mental tasks in which you engage in the course of working that are as demanding as ad three or even demanding as story six digits for immediate recall. We normally avoid mental overload by dividing our task into multiple easy steps. That is fucking true. Uh, comment, committing intermediate results to long-term memory or to paper rather than to, easy, to an easily overload working memory. We cover long distances by taking our time and conduct our mental lives by the law of least effort. Speaking of attention and effort, I won't try to solve this while driving. This is a pupil dilating task. It requires mental effort. The, laws of, the law of least effort is operating here. He will think as little as possible. She did not forget about the meeting. She was completely focused on something else when the meeting was set and she just didn't hear you. What came quickly to my mind was an intuition from system one. I'll have to start over and search my memory deliberately. That is chapter two. Thanks for watching and reading with me, Yvonne, or Van, or whatever you want to call me, or the guy with glasses, or whatever. Anyway, we're going to go to chapter three on the next video. Cheers. Oh, like and subscribe and comment on your thoughts and ideas on what you think on this chapter. Cheers.